so yes, moving on to our next session. So we've got Rebecca Lawton from the LWA and we've got Rowan Dumper Pollard from the Organic Research Centre. And they're going to be talking to us about addressing the financial data gaps in agroecological farming. Thanks. Ah, good morning. I feel a bit of an interloper in this economic session because I'm also taking a chance to make a bit of a broader point about um, the agroecology research needs um, that we have to make the case to policymakers. So if you'll bear with me, I'll try and whiz quickly through the first few slides um, before we got to get on to the real economics. So, um, yes, I just wanted to make the case for the fact that advocating for agroecology is a very data hungry occupation. We need lots of economic data, productivity data and all sorts of other data. So um, in Land Workers Alliance, my role actually is in the campaigns team. I run the horticulture campaign. And but within the campaigns team across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, we're advocating to policymakers on behalf of agroecology. We're meeting with ministers, we're meeting with local councillors, MPs and producing documents that our members can also use when doing the same. And we're also really trying to counteract dominant narratives that the industrial way of farming is the only way that's going to feed the world. And all this requires evidence to make the case. Um, also, although I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, we need to be making the case to the public that um, agroecology has the answers. Um, and that's yet another quite steep hill to climb. So um, what evidence is needed? Well, we need to be making the case that agroecology can deliver a more resilient food supply system. Um, one of the first things that really got me into doing research on agroecology is was the need for data on productivity. And when Land Workers Alliance first started, I was actually trying to get um, funding to do data on the relative productivity of small farms compared to larger farms, because it was apparent from having talked to the Organic Research Centre and um, the Organic Farm Management Handbook that such data really didn't exist. Um, eventually, I got a bit of funding to do that work, but um, there's so much more that needs to be done on it. Um, there's also a need to do um, more work on the financial viability, although the two talks we've just had have been really interesting, and I really want to have further talks with you about those. Um, there's, I feel that we've got a real story to tell about the net zero credentials of agroecology and organic farming. But yet again, it feels like we're really on the back foot when it comes to having the evidence. We need, the evidence might exist, but bringing it together is also a really urgent need. I think, I mean, biodiversity is um, something that it's, there are clear biodiversity benefits, but it's quite a complex thing to bring all the data together in a small um, coherent package to explain to people. I'm not going to go through all of these, but the point is that we need to be joining the dots between the farming and food system and health benefits, attracting a new generation of land workers. And those previous two presentations have made this point very well. So Land Workers Alliance has been doing our own research ever since we began to meet our need for evidence um, and draw from our experiences as land workers. But the one great weakness, well, the several weaknesses are that it's not peer-reviewed research, um, and therefore it's considered to be grey literature. We ourselves, we lack the resources and skills to do um, pure academic research. Um, and we've been trying for the last few years to work with, in partnership with universities, because we are a campaigning organisation, not a research organisation. The only reason we've been doing research is simply because we felt that the kind of research that we need isn't being done to make the case that we need to make. Um, and so this was why ARC was set up, to communicate our research needs to academics. I realise there's a bit of a mistake there. ARC actually formed in 2020, so we're about to be um, four years old. 
Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, we're a collaboration. So it's not just Land Workers Alliance. There's the CSA Network, the Organic Growers Ali Alliance, Pasture for Life, and the Ecological Land Cooperative, but all organizations that are representing land workers, agroecological practitioners, farmers, growers, foresters. Um, in all, we represent about 6,000 practitioners. So um, that's quite a lot of land workers. And we're aiming to build stronger relationships between practitioners and academics. Well, I'll leave you to read that and move on. So this um, example, Horticulture Across Four Nations, is um, one of our latest outputs. And it's actually, rather than being a piece of research, it is um, our vision for the way we want horticulture in the UK to go. Um, and I won't talk about the actual report, that would take too long, but the premise of the report is that we need to um, substitute for at least some of the vegetables we're currently importing. Um, the places that we import vegetables from are already suffering from, the ex from climate change, water scarcity and other extreme weather. Um, but there's also a really strong economic argument for import substitution, because um, last year, the UK imported £2.7 billion worth of vegetables. And if we shifted 20% of that spending um, to local organic and agroecological production, that would keep about 588 million circulating in local economies, which can't be a bad thing. Now, to achieve that, it's quite a steep hill to climb. And again, I won't go into the details of it and the modeling that we did, but one key element of it was that um, every primary school child in the UK would get two portions of organic vegetables with every school meal, through which would be sourced through um, local organic producers. And we were able to um, make this um, claim with confidence because of some valuable action research that's been happening in South Wales. Um, so Amber Wheeler, who has been undertaking this work over the last few years, along with um, my colleague Holly Tomlinson from Land Workers Alliance, they couldn't be here. So I'm about to move on to Amber's slides that um, she has um, sent. So um, Amber has been working on vegetable, increasing vegetable consumption for many years and did her PhD on modeling increasing vegetable production in Wales. Um, she was working for the Food Foundation for many years, which you might know um, one of their campaigns has been Peas Please, which has been getting different organizations across the food system to pledge what they can do to get people to increase their vegetable consumption. So Amber's mode of, um, of research is action research. And um, she's, for some reason, this slide hasn't come through very clearly, but um, you get the general idea, which is that she's in this iterative loop of um, doing the research and learning, putting that into action, undertaking reflection, and then building on that. And the Welsh Veg into Schools project is a really beautiful example of, um, of how that works, because you've got this annual cycle of engaging with um, producers. Well, I'll move on to the next slide. So this is a picture of the ecosystem that the Welsh Veg into Schools collective requires. So absolutely key to it has been an extremely helpful wholesaler called Castel Howell. Um, who right from the beginning, three years ago, when the courgette pilot started um, as a very specific project where um, one new entrant farmer, a um, couple of farmers were producing courgettes to go into school meals, into a school food and fun project, just a holiday project, to get children eating veg and getting used to it by doing art projects with courgettes. And as we all know, in August, um, there are plentiful courgettes. And so it started off very, very specifically as a very manageable project. But then the next year they expanded to more schools, feeding more veg into school meals, working with some more farmers on different kinds of vegetables. 
Um, and I'll move on to the next slide. So um, in 2024, um, their ambition is that eight Welsh growers will supply 40 tonnes of veg, resulting in £100,000 worth of local sales um, of vegetables to schools. And um, applying another really valuable piece of economic research that's been done in the last few years, which is um, the New Economics Foundation's work with growing communities. Um, and that calculated um, in Hackney in London that for every pound spent on the vegetables um, bought by growing communities, there are 3.7 pounds, three pounds 70 worth of um, social and economic benefits. That's partly because all the produce is organic with all the um, environmental benefits of organic, but also really meaningful benefits in terms of the worker welfare with all workers not only being paid um, a London living wage, but also um, having a real sense of work satisfaction and quality of life in their work. Also the farmers um, being paid um, a decent amount that they can actually feel that their vegetables are being valued rather than that they're being squeezed for every pound. So applying the research from growing communities to Welsh veg into schools, this means that by the end of this year, in theory, about £370,000 worth of social and economic benefits would have been delivered. So um, initially, I mentioned the wholesaler Castel Howell, and what made this possible was that they were willing to um, subsidise it by paying the difference in cost between what they would be paying for um, imported non-organic vegetables and paying the higher price for local organic vegetables. And um, that enabled that to happen in the first year. In the second year, the Welsh government stepped in and were willing, having seen this action research working, they were willing to step in and pay that difference. At the moment, that difference is being um, made up for by the Bridging the Gap project, which is a funded project, a partnership between growing communities, Sustain, and I think it's the Soil Association. Um, but in the longer term, in order to sustain this difference being made, we've got to make the case that there's value being delivered. And that, um, so that um, rather than spending on, yes, rather than just paying for more expensive vegetables, as well as getting the vegetables, you're getting other benefits. So there's um, biodiversity gain and um, carbon savings. Um, and obviously no synthetic pesticides or residues running off into rivers. So um, Welsh Veg into Schools has been doing some work um, looking particularly at broccoli um, and looking at the difference in the carbon emissions from um, broccoli um, frozen imported broccoli compared to local um, organically produced broccoli. And not only are the transport impacts 80 to 90% lower, but also production impacts are 57% lower compared with industrial broccoli. Ultimately, um, they're aiming high. They're wanting um, every primary school meal in Wales to contain two portions of organically produced Welsh veg, um, which would which would require five thousand three hundred and thirty three tons, and generate fifteen million pounds worth of sales for agroecological Welsh producers, um, and that would really enable many more businesses to survive and thrive into the future and it would double the field veg area in Wales which um, is actually still not a great land take because at the moment um, yes it's 0.02 percent of the Welsh land area so that would only be doubling it to 0.04 so it doesn't mean that vast areas would be being put under production so action research working within collaborations in real time works well to drive change. And I just give that as one example of the many things that could happen and could be changing policymakers' minds and really the power of what we're all trying to do here in combining our efforts of research and 
advocacy. And so I'm going to hand over to Rowan. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, B. And yeah, really great to hear about the Welsh Vision Schools project. Um, I think uh, this, you yeah, know, in the sort of build up conversations with B and Amber to this talk, um, it was just really great to hear that some of the work we've been doing in the farm management handbook has helped with kind of strategizing and planning uh, for some of that work. I, I believe our sort of price and performance figures helped them a bit when working out how to deal with the, you know, the figures and numbers they needed to provide to the wholesaler. Um, so the rest of my slides are going to sort of cover what um, I guess we at the Organic Research Centre uh, um, have done and can try and do uh, to kind of answer some of the uh, the research needs that, that Bees illustrated just now. Um, so I'm going to go into a bit uh, about the Organic Farm Management Handbook and then I'll talk a little bit about some future work as well. Um, so the Farm Management Handbook is our sort of main practitioner focused output in the kind of field of um, farm financial data and sort of farm management. Um, and although we are having conversations at the moment about different ways that we can try and get this data across, so I think the workshop later is going to be really useful. We're, we're thinking about smaller, um, shorter formats and maybe using digital platforms as well to create, you know, less friction between uh, growers and farmers and uh, quite complex data at times. Um, so I guess for those who aren't familiar with it, it's the best way I describe it is it's sort of our attempt to try and write out everything that possibly is about the organic sector. Um, and so it's a really kind of comprehensive uh, guide. Uh, and it's, it's the first edition came out in 1994. Uh, and I uh, was lucky enough to be the lead writer and researcher on our 12th edition that we produced last year. Um, and the, the early, you know, on reflection, I, I would say it has been really hard um, and sort of echo what he was saying to, to pull all the information together to create sort of business and management advice um, for organic and sort of low input farming. It's, the data is very disparate uh, and early editions of the handbook tended to benefit from sort of much more, I guess, extensive programs looking at farm statistics for the organic sector, uh, often funded by DEFRA that we were engaged with. Um, and I've been mulling over a bit the last few months, you know, why, why is this book sort of relevant to the, the greater themes that are mentioned at this mm -hmm. conference? And it, it sort of had a, I had a penny drop moment, but it, it is a sort of three decade long uh, sort of live research programs, so, you know, there's 12 editions, we're constantly evolving and adapting the handbook to try and suit the needs of those that, uh, that read it, that are working in uh, food and farming. Um, so I'll try and whiz through this because I'm sure many of you might be familiar with what's inside. Um, I counted the other day and I was really shocked to realise I we produced 54 uh, gross margins for the, the organic sector last year, which I didn't realise it was so many. I was con I was writing so much. Um, and each one of those is obviously a really, you know, a series of conversations with people in the sector, um, reviews of secondary data. Uh, we also produce uh, whole farm gross margins. So there's five um, sort of organic uh, rotations uh, based on about, I think it's a 50 hectare farm example. So, you know, it could be a livestock focused gross uh, whole farm. It could be an arable focused or a, I think there's a horticulture focused one as well. And we uh, show the, the kind of average um, revenue and expenditure throughout a year. Uh, we have quite a large fixed cost section as well, um, large, often based on John Nick's data, but we have to adapt it to suit um, organic farming practices. Um, the handbook is also uh, a great resource for sort of advice and education that's available to the organic sector. Uh, and then we also have um, lots of sort of information pointing to best practice around organic farming. And, and in this, we try to utilize as much as possible the research we're doing at the moment across our five different research themes. Okay. Uh, and our approach, um, you know, our, we're, we have to be pragmatic at times because it's a huge piece of work, but it more or less follows a sort of typical action research approach. Um, so, you know, we plan, uh, so we have experts who re review the handbook at the start. Uh, we carry out initial data collection, uh, there could be secondary data, some primary data collection as well. Uh, we'll observe, so we'll um, 
you know, the, our findings then get reviewed and we, you know, make amendments and, and then, uh, you know, we publish and then we obviously, we gather feedback on that edition uh, that feeds into the next edition. Uh, so because we're, we're largely talking a lot about horticulture in this session, I'll, I'll just zoom in on our approach uh, to the horticulture section. Um, so with this, we we had um, two experts um, review the, the previous horticulture section uh, and sort of pull out it, largely its financial figures, but there's some management approaches as well that needed updating. Um, and, you know, for example, I think this was probably the easiest um, bit of the research I did. We had to take out the potato levy, which was moved, removed a few years ago. Um, the action was, we, we then surveyed our network of producers. And I think we mentioned a bit in the workshop yesterday about survey fatigue. It, it didn't go very well at all. Um, <laughs> we've got a very low number of responses. Um, I couldn't get the survey going. and. In the end, it resulted in me trying to get hold of um, a lot of growers, you know, during the height of growing season. So, it was, uh, yeah, if anyone's in the room, thank you so much for picking up my calls. Uh, but it was a lot of, you know, catching catching a grower when he's, he's driving five minutes down the road or something like that, you know. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so, so then we produced our gross margins. We, they were then reviewed again. Uh, and we published and we're sending out, we have actually sent out a survey now for users of the handbook um, to kind of understand better how, how they might want to receive that information. Um, and one of the responses we did get was that, you know, that the lots of people, particularly at events, um, felt that the small scale horticulture section was too small and we're missing out on, you know, helping a lot of kind of organic growers who often are small scale. Um, whilst we tend to focus uh, on field scale to try and mirror the, the Nix book. Um, so uh, zooming in again on horticulture, um, you know, I, I would say before I go into this, it's not all doom and gloom. Like there was definitely, you know, profitability in organic farms. Um, most of the gross margins would match their kind of non-organic organic equivalent in terms of um, profitability, but I, I was very concerned with some of the margins that we created for um, for horticulture. Uh, so it's particularly in cases where there was labour intensive costs, labour costs have really gone up in the last few years. Uh, so like leaks and courgettes, it was really hard um, to see how anyone was able to make, you know, to break even on those. Uh, and in cases where um, the labour uh, costs and the production costs were high, uh, we were seeing losses quite significant. So I think apples, okay, apples, uh, it was about £1,600 a hectare loss for that year. And I, I thought this can't happen and called up a lot of people. And this was definitely the case. Um, so I'm going to, in the interest of time, just whiz on. So in terms of, uh, this is just some little bit of work I've done taking existing data we have to try and sort of respond a bit to discussions I've had with B. And then we are looking, I've got a few projects coming up where we're looking to produce data, which can be shared in the moment, but and then also lead to more robust outputs that can support ag advocacy work in the future. Um, so just sort of summarizing the yields, uh, for, you know, if you're trying to make this case for small scale veg production, um, I've adapted the, the field scale yields and compared to, I mean, B, recognizes these figures, they're actually from a 2017 study. Um, but you can see, especially on the more technical, um, to produce vegetables like courgettes and, and leeks, you're getting much stronger yields in, in the smaller scale systems. Um, and then another piece I did sort of in conjunction with the with handbook was to track uh, retail price through time. So I tracked 21 different products. Um, I track them in a supermarket non-organic setting, looking at the, the top range rather than like the essential range, uh, track them in the supermarket um, price for organic, uh, and then in the independent retailer setting, and then the direct to customer model, which would be more, you know, what we're looking at in terms of small scale horticulture, lo local supply chains, growers selling directly to the customer. And on quite a few of the, I focus on vegetables, with sort of things like broccoli, uh, cauliflower, uh, potatoes, you know, more uh, cabbage is more typically, you know, associated with field scale production. There wasn't much competition to be seen between the sort of local supply chains and the, and the supermarket ones. But then if you look at, uh, again, these more sort of technical props, I think I had uh, courgettes and then behind, you know, I 
can't fit them all on the slide, sorry. <laughs> but uh, there was leeks, lettuce, tomatoes, uh, courgettes and aubergines. They were all com competing with the organic um, supermarket price. And then if you look at um, uh, sort of UK seasonal veg, so uh, kale I found, but then there was also, there was carrots uh, and strawberries as well. You're seeing that the, the small scale production is, is competitive um, with all, all the points of sale that I was monitoring. So, yeah, I, I just think from the data we have and from future projects, there's a real opportunity to kind of work with people in the sort of political advocacy space to produce the figures they need to then go on and try and get more or better support for uh, the types of farming we want to support. Uh, and I think, say thank you. Yeah.